Hello friends, it's Mr. Sam here. I'm so excited to have the opportunity today to hang out with you all. But before we get going, I want to remind you that it's really important that you put your full name in the comment box after you have watched this video. Today we have the opportunity to explore something called a watershed. Now, as spring comes upon us, you might be noticing that there is a lot of water melting from the snow high up in the mountains. And what we're gonna do today is we're gonna explore and investigate and see where does that water actually end up. Before we get grooving, I wanna remind us that we have some really special friends that join us at Mr. Sam's Club Chaos Videos. So, right over here is our beloved friend, Rosie Revere, the engineer. She does an excellent job of asking questions and helping guide our investigations as we learn all about the fun things we get to do in these Club Chaos videos. Right here is our other friend, Add a Twist. Now, Add a Twist, also has a keen set of eyes and make sure that we stay on task and listen to Mr. Sam. Oh my gosh, hello Mr. Sam. I am so excited to learn about watersheds today. Where does all that water go? Well, what we get to do today is find out. We've got a super duper fun day set up to learn about where all that snow melting high up in the Tetons is going. We're gonna kick things off by a did you know segment where we learn some cool facts about water here in Jackson Hole. Then we're gonna get really silly and we're gonna sing a song, one of Mr. Sam's favorites, the water cycle song. After that, we're gonna read a book all about the water cycle. Once we have finished our book, we're gonna move on to our word of the day, which is watershed. And we are gonna make sense of that word in two ways. First, we're gonna break it apart and see if we can figure out what watershed means. Second, we're gonna do a hands-on investigation where we go outside and we build our very own watershed. And after we have made sense of this new word, watershed, you all are going to go on a Google exploration and figure out where does the snow melting high up in the Tetons that eventually turns into a little water droplet and makes its way into a river, where does that end up? Since we're gonna be investigating where water goes after all that snow has melted, I thought I would throw out a fact today that is really specific to this investigation. So, did you all know that during the first week of May, there is almost 10 times the amount of water in the Snake River as there is in the first week of January? Now, how could that be? Does anyone have any ideas? Now, to get our heads in a good learning space, we are gonna learn one of Mr. Sam's favorite songs. This song is about the water cycle, something really relevant to what we will be discovering today. So, I have brought along our friend here, Miss Rosie. And she is going to teach us the three big things that happen to water as it cycles throughout the earth. So the first thing that Rosie is going to teach us about is something called evaporation. So Rosie says that evaporation is when water goes up as a gas. So I want everybody 
to go up as a gas. Up as a gas. This is evaporation. Then, once water is high in the sky, Rosie says it forms a cloud through condensation. Condensation. So, forms a cloud through condensation. Do it with me. Forms a cloud through condensation. Then, there is one last ingredient that Rosie wants to teach us about this water cycle. It's something called precipitation. When those clouds get so heavy and they can no longer contain that water, the water then drops. It's called precipitation. And it either comes in rain or snow, sometimes in hail, and then it comes all the way back down to the ground. So do it with me. Precipitation. Precipitation. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to work together with those three different ingredients, evaporation, condensation, and precipitation, and we're going to sing a song. Okay. So repeat after me to start, and then we'll have some fun with it. So the song begins with water travels in a cycle. Yes, it does. Hee-haw. Let me hear it from you. Awesome job. Okay. Water travels in a cycle. Yes, it does. Hee-haw. Water travels in a cycle. Yes, it does. Hee-haw. Then it goes up in evaporation. Awesome. Forms a cloud in condensation. Awesome job. Comes back down in precipitation. Yes, it does. Yee-haw. All right. So we got it. Let's give it a go. Water travels in a cycle. Yes, it does. Yee-haw. Water travels in a cycle. Yes, it does. Yee-haw. It goes up in evaporation, forms a cloud in condensation, comes back down in precipitation. Yes, it does. Yee-haw. And a little faster. Water travels in a cycle. Yes, it does. Yee-haw. Water travels in a cycle. Yes, it does. Yee-haw. It goes up in evaporation, forms a cloud in condensation, comes back down in precipitation. Yes, it does. Yee-haw! Water travels in a cycle. Yes, it does. Yee-haw! Water travels in a cycle. Yes, it does. Yee-haw! It goes up in evaporation, forms a cloud in condensation, comes back down in precipitation. Yes, it does. Yee-haw! And we'll slow it down. Whew. Water travels in a cycle. Yes, it does. Yee-haw! Water travels in a cycle. Yes, it does. Yee-haw! It goes up in evaporation, forms a cloud in condensation, comes back down in precipitation. Yes, it does. Woo! I was so happy to learn about the water cycle. Thank you, friends, for getting really silly with Mr. Sam. What we're going to do now to kind of make a little more sense of the water cycle and think a little deeper about it is we are going to read a book called The Water Cycle. And as we uncover all these cool things through this nonfiction text, I want you to think about the three following things. Number one, why is water important? 
not only to the land, but to us as well. Number two, what are those three phases of the water cycle again? And then lastly, number three, where can water be found? So this is a book called The Water Cycle by Tori Malouf. Here's a table of contents over here to help us guide through this non-fictional text. But I think, because we're all such great readers, we are gonna read through the entire book. Water world. Clouds gather. The sky grows dark. The wind whistles. Small drops of rain begin to fall. Then the large, loud storm begins. Soon, water is everywhere. When there's a storm, it's easy to find water. But if you look closely, even on a sunny day, there is water all around. Here's a cool little fact. Old water. Most of the water on Earth is really old. It has been around for billions of years. Oh my gosh, how could that be? Water flows through streams. It runs down rivers. It fills our oceans. Waves of water crash on our beaches. Water is in plants. Water is in animals. Water is even in you. It is everywhere and it is on the move. Our bodies are made mostly of water. And here's a great picture of water flowing through a stream. Liquid, solid, gas. Water moves and changes. It can be a liquid. This means it flows freely. The water you drink is a liquid, but if the air gets cold, water can freeze. It turns into a solid. Ice is a solid. When liquid water gets hot, it changes again. It turns into a gas. Then it is called water vapor. So here's a picture of water in that vapor form. It's gas, it's that steam coming out of the tea kettle. And then here it is in its liquid form, the stuff we like to drink. And then here in Jackson Hole, we know all about this. Snow and ice, water in its solid state. The cycle. Some things happen over and over. They occur in the same order. This is called a cycle. Water moves in a cycle. There are three parts of the water cycle. Evaporation. Oh, and they even sound it out for us. They chunk it out with us. Condensation and precipitation. The cycle starts when the sun warms the water. The water evaporates. It goes up into the sky. Next, the vapor rises into the air. There it cools and makes clouds. This is condensation. So way up in the sky, it's forming those clouds through condensation. As clouds get colder, tiny drops of water form. Soon, the drops fall from the clouds. Sometimes they fall as rain, other times they fall as hail. If it is cold enough, they fall as snow. These are all types of precipitation. The water falls to earth. It collects in lakes and rivers. It flows to the oceans. When the water warms up, the cycle starts again. Water travels in a cycle. Yes, it does. Wonderful water. All living things need water. Plants need water to grow. 
they get water through their roots way down here in this plant. Thin tubes carry the water up their stems. This is the stem of the plant. Water then passes through their leaves. It turns to vapor. Right here, that water going through the leaves and then turning into that gas. Animals need water too. They must drink water to live. Here's a cool fact about your pets, cats and dogs. When a dog pants, water leaves its body as a vapor, that gas. Water can leave a cat's body through its nose. Have you ever noticed the cat's nose is super duper wet? Humans also need water to live. When you drink water, it moves through your body. It keeps you healthy. Some of the water leaves your body. This happens when you sweat and when you go to the bathroom. We use water in many ways. It is not just for drinking. We use water to clean things, including our cells. We use water to grow food to eat. We use water to cook food. We also use water to make power. We can use that power to light our homes. So here's water used through something known as irrigation to keep those plants nice and wet that we are growing. Here we are using some water to cook some potatoes. And then this is a really famous dam called the Hoover Dam. It's a hydroelectric dam that produces power through water movement. My gosh, water. Saving our water. We need water to live. It is important that we do not waste it. There are many ways you can save water. You can take shorter showers. You can turn the sink off while you brush your teeth. If you have a pipe that leaks, make sure you get it fixed right away. So water is really important to us, my friends. We must keep our water clean. If it is dirty, we cannot use it. Factories may make water dirty. They may leak chemicals, these gross things, into it. This pollutes, ooh, we don't want pollution, the water. Pollution makes water unsafe. Oil may spill into the ocean. This hurts plants and animals that live there. Some may even die. So it's really important that we keep our water clean and healthy with little pollution in it. Sometimes unsafe gases get into the air. Power plants that use coal may make these gases. Old cars and factories may make these gases too. These gases mix with water vapor, that gas, in the air. This makes something known as acid rain. Acid rain then falls back to earth. It pollutes the water. It can kill plants and it can make animals sick. Ugh, that sounds like something we don't want. The water cycle just never ends. It keeps on going. This is a good thing since we need water to live. It is important to know how the water cycle works. This helps us know why we need to keep our water safe and clean. My friends, I hope you enjoyed that book as much as I did. It was really a great and exciting nonfiction read. So going back to those three questions, I'm wondering what your thoughts and ideas are about the first one. Why is water important? So what did we uncover in that book? So a couple things here. One is we all need water to live. And then the book talked about all these amazing things that you all can do with water too. They talked about cooking with water. They talked about making electricity with water. 
my gosh, it sounds like water is really important. The second thing they discussed are those three phases of the water cycle. And they told us that water is always cycling. That cycle never stops. It just keeps going and going and going. And those three phases are evaporation, when the water goes up, condensation, when it forms that cloud, and then precipitation, when it starts to rain or snow and that water comes back down and then could cycle up again. And then where can water be found? Well, first and foremost, we are mostly water. So water can be found within us, but then it's all those lakes, streams, rivers, high in the mountains. There are so many places where water can be found and we need every last drop of it. Now, what you all have maybe noticed within the past few weeks, as the temperatures have started to go up and up, is that all of a sudden, the streams like Flat Creek and Game Creek have started to get bigger and bigger. Has anyone checked out the Snake River lately? And what is happening is snow is melting from all the mountains, all the hills all around us, and it eventually, some of it, might make its way into those drains or the creeks and the rivers all around us here in Jackson Hole. But what we want to discover today is when that snow does melt, where does it ultimately end up? So to really understand the journey of a water droplet, starting high up in the Teton Mountains, we need to learn about our word of the day. Our word of the day today is the word watershed. Has anybody heard of that word? I have, Mr. Sam. I think what it means is all the land surrounding a body of water, like a river. And that river is basically like the drain of that landscape. Huh. At a twist, might be spot on. So this is really kind of a big vocab word for us to make sense of, but it's really important for our investigation today. So when we talk about a watershed, we are talking about all the land surrounding a body of water, like a river or a pond or a lake or even an ocean. Now that body of water is basically the drain of the landscape. And what this word watershed really means is if it rains on this hillside, that water will eventually flow into the drain or that body of water, the river. So for instance, here in the Tetons, if this big hillside up into this dotted line is the Tetons, if it rains right here, do, 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 then it will flow into this river. But this whole area of land, all of the Teton Mountains, is the watershed. When we talk about watersheds, we are talking about the landscape surrounding that body of water. All right, I'm throwing a lot at you right now, and I want to help you make sense of this word watershed by using the most basic metaphor that Mr. Sam could think of. And that ultimately is our bathtub. Our bathtub is a watershed. Now, for instance, in a bathtub, the entire tub would be the watershed, and then 
the drain is, in this very most literal sense, the drain of that tub. So if it showers, if that shower hose sprays water on any part of this landscape, any part of that bathtub, it is all ultimately going to drain into this one drain. Just like if we go back to this picture, if it rains anywhere within this dotted line, it will drain into that river. Am I making sense? Now, you might notice though, that watersheds have a divide. Watersheds are separated by big hills or ridges. Because if it rains on this side of the ridge, it's going to flow that way. But if it rains on this side of the ridge, it's gonna flow the other way. And that's what this dotted line symbolizes. If it were to rain over here, it would not drain into this river. It would go into this river that doesn't exist in this diagram, but way over here. Now with a bathtub, you can think of these hills and ridges as the very side of the tub. So if you wanted to be a little silly, you could grab that shower head and move it all the way to the right so that it was spraying water over here beyond the edge of the tub. And then it would no longer drain into this drain, but would become a big puddle on the floor. And therefore, that water would then become a part of a different watershed. Oh, Mr. Sam, Mr. Sam, uh, this word watershed is really throwing me for a couple loops. Can you help me out a little bit? So, one thing that really helps Mr. Sam make sense of a new term or a new word is to model it. So, for our hands on activity today, we are going to do an activity called model a watershed. And what you will need for this are three simple things. One is you're going to have to head outside and you're going to have to find a piece of ground with some rocks and dirt, some leaves, something to make little mounds and hills and valleys to really model what the landscape might look like for a watershed. Two, you're going to get a cup of water. And if you have it, you could get a spray bottle. This is going to be our precipitation, our rain and water for our watershed. And then lastly, you need to get a piece of aluminum foil. And what we're going to do is we're going to build a model landscape. All right, with hills and valleys using the dirt and rocks. And then we're gonna take that sheet of aluminum foil and put it over that landscape that we have made. And then it's gonna rain and we're gonna see how water travels throughout the different watersheds that we have created. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna head outside and I am going to model the model so that you all have an idea of how to build your watershed. All right, my friends. So Mr. Sam is out here with all his materials. He's got that nice patch of ground with some rocks, some leaves, some stuff to really play around with. He's got that sheet of aluminum foil. And then lastly, he's got some water. This is gonna be our rain. So the first thing that we all need to do is we need to build our landscape. So we wanna build up some hills and ridges and valleys. 
to explore how water moves throughout this landscape. So I'm just going to take a second. I've got a nice mountain chain forming here. Maybe we could call this the Tetons. What do you think about that? And then let's see. Maybe I'll build a, a butte. Maybe we could call this high school butte over here. And lastly, what do we think? Maybe one more butte. We could call this Grovant Butte. So we have the Tetons, the big mountain chain right here. Then we have High School Butte that we piled up some rocks and leaves. And then we have Grovant Butte. Then what you all need to do is you're going to take your sheet of aluminum foil and then place it over the landscape that you have created. And then make sure you push it down nicely so that you can really see the different features of the landscape that you have built. Now, what you want to do is you can decorate it. So maybe I want to build a little house. And make it look really, really pretty. Here's a couple rocks. Maybe this is the ball field, but have fun with this. And after you have decorated your landscape, what you want to do is see how water moves throughout the landscape. Oh. Oh my gosh, friends, the wind is picking up. I see these dark clouds moving into view. It is a stormy day out here, and all of a sudden, it is starting to rain. Oh, it is coming down in buckets, my friends. So much rain. It's raining on the Tetons. It's raining on Grove on Butte, and it's raining on High School Butte, and it is just flooding into those drains, the rivers. Whew. That was quite the storm that we all experienced. And I want you all to do the same with the watersheds that you have built. And remember, you can use that cup of water. So after we have seen how water moves throughout this landscape, I want you to take a pause and look at some things and notice where that water is collecting and going. The one thing that I see here is that a lot of water collected right around here. That when I spread this hillside, or the mountainside of the Tetons, that water made its way down the side of these mountains and collected right here. But also when I spread over here, the same thing happened. However, when we were spraying, what was this? I'm getting lost now. I think Grovant View. The water did not drain over here, but rather it drained way back here. So what that is telling me is that I have two separate watersheds. I've got a watershed right here collecting from the Tetons and High School Butte. And then I have a watershed right here that is draining off the side of Grovant View. Now, I want you to do the same with your own landscape. Spray some water on it, and then notice 
where it goes and try to identify the different watersheds. Remember, it's all of the tub that drains into that one place. All right, my friends, hopefully you enjoyed that activity and learned a little more about watersheds. But before we move on, I just want to review some of the key components of what a watershed is. So first and foremost, it's an area of land that feeds a drain. And when we talk about drains in watersheds, we are talking about rivers. And for our investigation today, the river that is fed by this huge watershed is, does anyone have any ideas? It is the Snake River. All of this land surrounding the Snake River, starting here in Wyoming, going through Idaho, all the way to Washington, feeds the Snake River. Secondly, Watersheds are separated by hills and mountains. So if it rains on this side, it is gonna go into a different drain than if it rained on this side. On this map of the Snake River watershed, this black line represents that edge, the divide created by hills and mountains. So if it were to rain over here in the orange, it would go into a different watershed. There is one last thing that I want to add to your understanding of watersheds. Watersheds are kind of like Russian dolls. Who has ever played with a Russian doll? So a Russian doll is kind of like an onion. Okay, you have to start one teeny itty bitty layer, and then you have a bigger layer, a bigger layer, a bigger layer, and a bigger layer. So watersheds are the same way. You can start with a small watershed, just a stream, and then that watershed is a part of a larger watershed and a larger watershed until you get to the very biggest watershed. The two biggest watersheds here in the United States are the Pacific Ocean watershed and the Atlantic Ocean watershed. And the divide between those two biggest watersheds is something called the Continental Divide. Who has heard of that? I am Mr. Sam. I think it actually goes through someplace in Wyoming. Oh, Miss Ada is very correct. Wyoming is actually the state that has that mountaintop that separates our two biggest watersheds. So, my final challenge for you all, knowing that there are two really, really, really big watersheds in the United States, the Pacific watershed and the Atlantic watershed. I want you to use Google Maps and figure out if a water droplet that starts here in the Tetons and then makes its way into the Snake River and then starts flowing into that river, would it ultimately end up in the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean? And would it be a part of the Atlantic watershed or the Pacific watershed? So use Google Maps to help you figure that out. And I cannot wait to see your answer of what watershed that Teton water droplet is a part of in the comment box and make sure you put your name in that comment so that we know you were here hanging out with us. All right, my friends, thank you so much for viewing this video, hanging out with Mr. Sam, and I can't wait 
to see all of your discoveries in that comment box.